Did you know that in One Piece there are 18 different races and that three of them can actually control elements like water and fire? Or that we have confirmed proof of a 1000 year long war that began well before the Void Century? Or that there are three ancient magical trees that are all thousands of years old and that one of them might even grow inside of the red line? Well, today we're going to dive down the One Piece lore iceberg, going from the most surface level lore that even the most casual One Piece fans should know about, down to the absolute deepest and darkest secrets of tier number 6, where the most secret and wild lore facts about One Piece are hidden, like the crucial role that the whales play in protecting the One Piece. But for now, we're starting off with tier level 1, or the tip of the iceberg still above the surface. And why not kick things off with the lore that is so important, it is literally the title of the story, and that is of course the actual One Piece treasure which inspired the great age of piracy and sent pirates like Luffy to chase after this <laughs> mythical treasure. Now there are in fact many many things that we do know about the One Piece. For example we do know that it is supposed to be located on Laugh Tail which is the final island of the Grand Line and on top of that the author has also told us that the actual One Piece treasure isn't just something cheesy like the friends we made along the way or something like that. No, it is something physical and real. In fact, the treasure is supposed to include something that was left behind by a legendary figure from the past, and it also includes all of the former Pirate King Goldie Rogers treasure as well. Plus, Roger and his crew are, so far as we know, the only people to have ever found this island love tale in over 800 years, so even though this iceberg contains tons of mind-blowing answers to One Piece's biggest secrets, this one mystery is one that is still unanswered even to this day. And if you've ever read or watched all of One Piece, then you should know about the Poneglyphs as well, which are these giant unbreakable stones that tell the ancient history of the so-called Void Century. Now, don't worry, we will be talking about the Void Century in a lot more detail in just a moment, but the most important Poneglyphs out of these are the so-called Four Road Poneglyphs, which contain the information that you need in order to find the Island Love Tale. In fact, these four are so important that the strongest pirates in the world try to regularly find or steal them so that they can actually be the ones to finally find the One Piece and become the next Pirate King. However, these red poneglyphs are far from the only versions of these stones, which were hidden all around the world by the so-called Ancient Kingdom. And without getting too deep into tier 2 iceberg territory quite yet, the Ancient Kingdom is a kingdom that basically ruled over the world before the current world government defeated them sometime between 8 and 900 years ago. Now, the reasons for why and how the world government might have defeated the ancient kingdoms are too spicy for just tier level 1, so we'll be saving that information for just a few more minutes down the iceberg. So for now, just know that the current world government somehow defeated this ancient kingdom and took over power. Now, the worst thing about this though is that the world government then decided that all history of that time period needed to be completely erased. As a result, this is why that period of time is now called the void century, because almost all information about it has been completely wiped from the history books. All texts about it were destroyed, important people who knew anything about it were killed, and even to this day, anyone who researches the void century, or the Poneglyphs for that fact, is hunted down and killed by the world government, as we for example saw during Robin's flashback. Now, I've already mentioned the Grand Line, which is the stretch of water right here where all the strongest pirates and marines are located, but did you know that it also has has some important lore regarding the world as a whole. Because during the Baratia arc, we actually learned that Sanji's dream is to find the mythical All Blue. In case you forgot, the All Blue is rumored to be a place in the world where the water from all four blues, the South Blue, East Blue, West Blue, and North Blue, meets. And what makes it so special to Sanji is that this place is set to contain fish that can't be found anywhere else in the world. And while we're all always excited to see Sanji whip up some brand new dishes here or there, the important thing for the lore of the world is that this place currently doesn't seem to exist because the world is separated by the red line, which is this massive stone barrier continent that goes all the way around the world, and the calm belts, which are these parallel stretches of water that border the Grand Line. And while you might now say that the all blue does exist right here, I think we can safely say that this 
isn't the all blue since Sanji already passed this way and didn't think that it was the all blue. Which might mean that later on something will happen to the red line and the four blues will be reunited after all once again. However, you might be surprised to hear that this wasn't the only important world lore that was dropped early on in the story. Because when we were introduced to the warlord system just before the Arlong Park arc back in the East Blue, we all of a sudden learned that there were people out there way stronger than anyone we had faced so far. Now, the important basics of the warlord system are that the world government was basically inviting strong pirates to work with them. In exchange, these pirates get their bounties frozen and can essentially do whatever they want as long as they come when the world government calls them to fight. And for now, the only warlord that I want to mention in tier number one is Dracul Mihawk, who we learned is the strongest swordsman in the world and even used to duel with the Emperor Red Hair Shanks. And speaking of Shanks, it's time to drop some basic tier one lore about the entire Yonko or Emperor system of pirates as well. Basically, this system is essentially made up of the four strongest pirate crews who dominate the final part of the Grand Line, which is also called the New World. They are so powerful that even the world government struggled to defeat even one of these insanely powerful pirate crews. In fact, it did take the world government plus the combined strength of all the warlords to actually almost rival the empress, which all together creates the three great powers of the One Piece world. And these Empress of the Sea have been Luffy's main rivals during the second half of the story. However, you might be surprised to learn that the Empress system itself hasn't been around forever because as far as we know, it did not even exist before Roger became Pirate King and the previous era of piracy might have only been ruled by one or two really strong pirate crews. But now of course we can't talk about the strongest pirates without mentioning the most well-known abilities in One Piece as well. I'm of course talking about Devil Fruits. And while the true origins of these powers still somewhat remain a mystery to this day, many legends consider these fruits to be kind of like pieces of the sea devil that take the form of a fruit. Which means that by eating that fruit, you actually take a piece of a sea devil inside of you. Although all of this is just legend and there are some really strong theories about the real origins of devil fruits that we'll be getting into later on. However, once a person does take a bite of a fruit, they instantly gain the powers of that particular fruit for the rest of their life. The only real downside here is that they can no longer swim and will literally drown if they fall into water. Besides that though, it's pretty commonly known that there is only ever one of each devil fruit in the world at a time, so there can never be two people with the exact same powers. Oh yeah, and uh, if you eat two devil fruits, then you'll explode. At least that's according to legend, but we've actually seen someone do this in the story and they were just fine, so more on this later. But one of the most interesting things about the One Piece lore is that there are many races in the One Piece world that have their own unique elemental abilities. For example, the animal mink tribe have natural electricity, the fishmen can control water, to some degree at least, and these angel-like creatures even have natural fire powers. And these are just some of the many, many races in One Piece though, because besides humans, there are also giants, dwarfs, long arm, leg, neck people, winged people, People and much, much more that we'll discuss later. And what's most incredible here though, is that all of these races have very detailed histories that connect together back to the Void Century. In fact, many of these races were even friends of the ancient kingdom and still protect the Poneglyphs from the world government to this day. And now before we get deeper into this iceberg below the surface, here's a fact that you've probably heard even if you haven't watched or read One Piece at all. And that is that Luffy's childhood friend Ace is actually the son of the former pirate king Goldie Roger. Oh yeah, and uh, he also died at the climax of the Marineford War, which uh, as far as we know, ended the bloodline of the former pirate king for good. However, in one way, both Ace and Roger are actually still alive. Shocking, right? I know. But that's because we're going to start tier level two below the surface with the idea of inherited will. Now, this is kind of the part of the iceberg slightly below the surface, which represents lore that you most likely must have picked up if you've watched or read One Piece more than once, and Inherited Will is one of those super, super important concepts that you probably don't remember if you're a casual viewer only. And basically, the idea behind Inherited Will is that if someone dies without fulfilling their dream or purpose, then someone else who comes after them
them can inherit their will and continue their dream for them, technically keeping them alive in some way or form. In fact, this can even apply to entire generations passing on their will to future generations, and this is probably best shown by Roger himself and the Emperor Whitebeard, who both weren't able to bring true peace to the world, but passed their dreams on to the next generation. And to explain that a little bit further, Roger found the One Piece, but actually, according to himself, was too early to use whatever information or power was left from the Void Century, and so because he ended up having an incurable disease and was about to die anyways, he turned himself into the Marines. This then gave him a huge public platform for his execution, which led him to inspire the entire next generation of pirates to go search for the One Piece. And pretty much the same thing can be said of Whitebeard as well, because with his dying breath, he confirmed that the One Piece was in fact real, which further inspired hope for the current generation like Luffy to actually go and continue searching for this legendary treasure. But this idea of inherited will, a central theme in the story, works on a much smaller level as well, as many of the Straw Hats have even inherited the will of their prior mentors as their own dreams. For example, Chopper wanting to become a great doctor like his first mentor, and Robin inheriting the will of the Scholars of Ohara to find out what happened during the Void Century. Now, before we move much further here though, let's dive in a little bit more about the actual One Piece and the Void Century here. Because I just said that Roger was too early to use what we left on Love Tale, which means that we need to ask exactly what this legendary treasure actually is. And well, there are a few possibilities, but to truly understand the possibilities, we first have to take a look at the people we actually know from the Void Century and what they could have possibly left behind. And the first and most important of these people is a legendary figure called Joy Boy. And the very first time that we hear about this character was actually during the Fishman Island arc after the time skip, when we learned that Joy Boy wrote a mysterious letter of apology to a former mermaid princess about a promise that he was not able to keep. Now, we don't know exactly what that promise specifically was, but we can guess that it probably involves the fishmen having to live at the bottom of the sea to escape oppression up on the surface and Joy Boy helping them to get back to that surface. Which leads us to the probably most mysterious event and time period in all of One Piece, which is the war between the Ancient Kingdom and the 20 kingdoms who later founded the world government. And while we still don't know a ton about what exactly happened, we do know that some Somehow the 20 kingdoms won, the ancient kingdom was destroyed, and the poneglyphs were created by the ancient kingdom to keep the world government from completely erasing the ancient kingdom's history and keeping some hope for future generations. Now interestingly enough, we do actually know that these unbreakable stones were created by the Kozuki clan from Wano, who are just one of the many, many confirmed allies of that former ancient kingdom. However, after this great war, the world government was then formed by the 20 kingdoms and they have ruled the world together ever since. As for the Ancient Kingdom, we don't really know if they had an actual home island or home country somewhere in the world. It could have of course been Love Tale itself, or it could have been an island destroyed long long ago, but we do know that all of the known allies of the Ancient Kingdom are not allies of the world government. For example, the Samurais of Wano, the Sky People, the Fishmen, Minx, and we assume even the Giants of Elbeth as well. Plus, as we learned during the Wano arc, there is also a legendary figure called Nika who was known as the Sun God. Now, we don't really know if Joy Boy and the Sun God were the same people. In theory, both of these could just be titles that many different people could have inherited throughout the centuries, but we do know that Luffy has now awakened his devil fruit called the Nika fruit and inherited both Nika's and Joy Boy's will to bring freedom to the world. And now, while much of the lore of the Ancient Kingdom is still very much hidden, there are some absolute facts that we do know for sure about that time period as well. First of all is that this giant ship here was created in order to carry all of the fishmen and merfolk from the bottom of the ocean up to the surface. We kind of assumed that this was part of Joy Boy's promise to that mermaid princess back when he was not able to keep it. And with all of this that we've been reviewing about the Ancient Kingdom, I think we can get a pretty good idea about what the One Piece actually might be. Because it does seem like the main idea that is usually associated with Joy Boy and Nika is the idea of freedom for the many, many races of oppressed people around the world. And so the One Piece has to be at least somehow related to freeing the world, right? If that's true, the One Piece could be some sort of powerful
powerful weapon or maybe even some sort of information that will help defeat the world governments. However, while Joy Boy is the ancient figure we are most excited to learn about, there is one other legendary ancient hero that we have actually met in the story. And that's because the sword god Yuma from Wano was turned into a zombie that Zoro then fought during the thriller Bark Art. And while this was the very first time that we met him, we then later learned that Ryuma is actually considered a national hero in Wano who once defended the country during its own golden era. What we don't know is exactly how long ago Ryuma actually lived, but it would make a lot of sense to me if he actually lived sometime around the white century, since it would his timeline line up pretty nicely with some other important people from that same time period. And in fact, sticking with the island of Wano, there's actually some very interesting lore regarding the actual geography of that country. Because while we've had a few maps showing the layout of this really oddly shaped country, there are a few mysteries surrounding the country's origins as well. That's because if you look at the map here, it really does look like Wano is kind of made up of many different islands that were kind of pulled together into one bigger one. And what's even weirder is that the weather patterns for each of these sections are completely different from each other. And so if you combine that knowledge with what we know about islands in the Grand Line all having their own weather patterns, then it makes a lot of sense that this island of Wano that exists above the water might have once actually been several different islands that were somehow smushed together to create this new bigger Wano country. And funnily enough, we even have a race of extra big giants who are literally called continent pullers. So that is just one more piece of evidence to support this potential lore right here. And now you might be wondering why Wano would be created like this in the first place. And one possible answer might come from the lore surrounding slavery in One Piece. Because even though slavery is technically outlawed by the world government, it very much clearly still exists as we see with the slave auction house during the Saba Odi arc, plus the fact that the celestial dragons themselves ride around on slaves and use slaves to operate their giant moving walkway. And this connects to Wano plus many of the other allies of the ancient kingdom because there is some evidence to suggest that the world government and even people who ruled the world before them used to enslave many of the people and races from around the One Piece world. For example, about 1000 years before the present storyline, the animal mink tribe moved their entire population to live on the back of this giant elephant. Why did they do that? Well, the most likely reason is to escape the oppression just like the fishmen who moved to the bottom of the ocean. We also have a dwarf tribe that we met in Dressrosa who once fled their kingdom and were later enslaved by the ruling family of Dressrosa. And these dwarfs were only freed once that ruling family actually moved to the top of the red line to become celestial dragons after the void century as part of the 20 kingdoms that founded it. In other words, clearly slavery has been a really big deal for a very long time in One Piece and to to bring this all back to Wano, it is very possible that Wano itself was created as a sort of sanctuary to protect a group of humans and other races from the oppression of other humans or some other super powerful race. In fact, speaking of powerful races, there is none more powerful in One Piece than the Lunarians here, whose introduction near the end of the Wano arc absolutely blew everyone's minds. And that is because this race of angelic winged people once actually lived on top of the red line before they were almost completely wiped out. Not only that, in fact they were once actually referred to as a tribe of literal gods which does make me think that they probably once actually ruled over the world, similarly to how humans rule the One Piece world right now. And to explain what makes them so so powerful, the Lunarians get their incredible powers from this magical flame on their back which allows them to create fire and become nearly in invincible while that flame is active. And now you might be wondering how they were defeated if they were so incredibly powerful, but that's a bit of lore too juicy for tier number two, so we'll discuss it a lot further down this iceberg. And anyways, what is more important here though is that the current most individually powerful race is without a doubt the race of giants. Because come on, 
These people are simply massive and their average warrior is easily worth at least 100 regular humans. And most giants come from the legendary island of Elbath, but what you might not know is that giants actually live in many places around the world, as we learned during Robin's flashback as well. But honestly, if there's one island everyone's very excited to visit, it's definitely Elbath because it has some truly insane lore. First off, the entire island is basically based off of Norse mythology, and we can kind of see that based on the design of their architecture. The name of their ruler is Loki, who is the Norse god of trickery and mischief, or god of stories, and also the fact that there is this giant tree, sometimes shown in the background of Elbath, which reminds me of the world tree Yggdrasil from Norse mythology. However, while it is likely inspired by that mythical tree, we most likely already know that this tree's real name in one piece is the treasure tree Adam. Now, in case you forgot, we learned during the Water 7 arc that the wood from this Adam tree is unbelievably strong, so much so that Frankie made the Straw Hat's new ship, the Thousand Sunny, out of that wood. Plus, we do know that this tree is located in a very war-torn country, which perfectly fits Elbath. And actually, while we're talking about that treasure tree Adam, this is the perfect time to mention that there are actually some other super important trees in the One Piece world as well. The second is the Sunlight Tree Eve, which we first learned about during the Fishman Island arc. This truly incredible tree absorbs sunlight and then filters down light and oxygen to the roots of it that are located at the bottom of the ocean, right above Fishman Island. And what you may not realize here is that we don't actually know where the top of that tree actually is located. You might assume that it is directly above Fishman Island since that is where its roots are, but that is never actually confirmed and right above Fishman Island is actually the giant red line. So unless the sunlight tree is somehow part of the red line inside of it or on top of it, then it could very well be located somewhere else entirely. And continuing with the theme of biblical references, there is also the tree of knowledge that was located on the island of Ohara before it was then destroyed by the world government. This also massive tree served as the home base for the scholars of Ohara, who were a group that were dedicated to researching the Pony glyphs and the history. This of course ended up leading to their destruction when the world government finally came and destroyed the island with a so-called buster call, which tragically also burned down this truly magnificent tree of knowledge. And while we don't know if this tree actually had any sort of special characteristics like the Adam or the Eve tree, the planting of the tree of knowledge itself is actually the oldest confirmed event in all of One Piece lore, which took place about 5,000 years before the current storyline. Now, that's of course not to say that the two other trees can't be older though, we just don't know for sure at this point. And in fact, one thing that may hint at the treasure tree Adam being way older than that is its sheer size. I mean, we haven't ever seen a full clear picture of it yet, but there have been hints that this tree is truly, truly massive, like this image right here. In fact, it is so massive that we know it might even reach up to the Sky Island level itself. And this was actually hinted to that during the Skypea arc when we learned that there is something called the Path of the High West, which is the regular official way that usually people reach the Sky Islands from. And from this we can speculate that it must somehow be some sort of massive safe way for people to actually reach the Sky Islands, which just makes a lot of sense for that then to be this incredibly huge tree. Plus, we do have these giant vines such as the Giant Jack that could even be branches that spread out from this massive tree. And actually, now that we are on top of the sky people, we simply have to mention the fascinating lore behind these winged races that you actually might have missed if you've only watched the anime. And that's because during Enel's cover story in the manga, we learned that the sky people once lived up on the moon. Now it is a bit of a mystery when they lived there or for how long, but one thing that is certain is that they were once up on the moon and later had to descend down to earth. Which is actually how two of the sky races at least ended up on the clouds, while the third race found themselves down on the island of Jaya. And it was actually very important that this Shandian tribe came down to the Blue Sea because they eventually also became an ally of the Ancient Kingdom. We know this because they have long guarded a poneglyph that contains the secret location of an ancient weapon, which we will be discussing more about in just a moment. But for now, the Shandians used to be an incredibly wealthy society, even making an entire city out 
out of gold, but their downfall started when they became involved in some sort of major war, most likely during the battle against the 20 kingdoms during the Void Century. And we actually learn all of this during the flashback during the Skypea arc, which told us the story of Nolan the Liar. Now, the important lore to know from this flashback is that ever since the Void Century, the Shandian people were protecting the golden city of Shandora and the Poneglyphs until a super powerful water burst shot part of their island up into the sky around 400 years ago. This actually put the Shandian people back into conflict with the other winged races and they continued their conflict until Luffy and the Straw Hats brought them together during the Sky PR. And continuing with epic events from the past, 100 years ago, the legendary captains of the giant pirate crew started their never-ending duel on the island of Little Garden. Which is actually kind of tragic if you think about it because two friends nearly killed each other over a simple disagreement. But honestly, nothing is probably as tragic in One Piece as Brook's backstory, which contains a super important hint about the secrets of the One Piece. Because around 50 years ago, the crew befriended a baby whale named Laboon, who had been separated from its family pots. However, the crew had to leave Laboon behind once they actually entered the Grand Line and they promised to return once they traveled around the world. Now sadly, the crew never made it as they were wiped out completely by a deadly disease and poison, but the important part about all of this is that ever since that day, the music-loving Laboon was waiting for his crew to return. And while that never happened, his presence at the start of the Grand Line is just the start of some sort of secret lore regarding the one piece that we will simply have to save for way way down at the bottom of this iceberg, but keep it in mind. However, for the entire time that Laboon was waiting for his crew, there was actually this old man who was taking care of him. Because this is Crocus and man, when we first met him, I don't think anyone would have believed that he is one of the few people alive who actually knows what the One Piece treasure actually is. And that's because we later learned that he was once a member of Roger's crew when they actually actually found the legendary treasure. And aside from Crocus, there's also one other man who the Straw Hats met who also knows what that treasure is, and that's of course Silver's Rayleigh here, Roger's former vice captain, and surprisingly, those are the only two people we currently know of who absolutely 100% for sure know what that treasure is. Although to be fair, there might be others like the leaders of the world government who might know as well. However, if we had to pick any other candidates to possibly know the truth, a very good choice would be the world's greatest scientist, Dr. Vegapunk. And we'll actually be discussing more of his lore and why he might know quite a lot about the One Piece in a deeper tier, but his basic backstory is that he is a genius scientist who has worked for the world government for many, many years. In fact, it is said that he's such a scientific genius that he is technologically 500 years more advanced than anyone else in the entire world. And his creations include things like these destructive cyborgs and even a perfect clones devil fruit. But now for the final piece of lore for tier number two, we simply have to include here the legendary pirate Rox de Zebek, who nearly conquered the entire world 38 years ago. This man was considered Roger's greatest rival, and he even gathered a ridiculously powerful crew full of future Emperor of the Seas like Whitebeard, Kaido, and Big Mom. However, what you may not realize about Rox is that he most likely had some sort of secret connection to the former Pirate King Goldie Roger and that they may have actually once been friends. But now enough with this casual normie level lore, because now it's time to dive deep into tier level 3, which is lore that you most likely know if you're plucked into the One Piece community and consume One Piece content outside of the main story, but that might be completely new to you if you're not. Starting with the rest of what we actually know about the Void Century. Because we've already established that during this time period there was a war between the ancient kings kingdom and the 20 kings who went on to form the world government, yada yada. But what you may not know is that the ancient kingdom was made up of allies from all over the world. Now we've touched on a few of them so far, but to truly understand this, we need to look at the most important clues that they left behind about their history. And there of course, I am talking again about the Poneglyphs, and let's dive into exactly what different kinds there are and where we have found these ancient texts in the world. So we've already discussed the four road Poneglyphs, which point the way to Love Tail, but they're actually known to be 30 Poneglyphs in total scattered all throughout the world. Nine of these are so-called Rio Poneglyphs, which tell the story of the ancient kingdom itself, while the others contain messages 
from people or information about the location of other Poneglyphs or secret weapons. And actually, the first time in a story that we learned about the Poneglyphs was in Alabasta. In fact, this Poneglyph was rumored to contain information about the ancient weapon Pluton that we will be explaining in more detail in just a minute. But first, since Alabasta protected a Poneglyph for eight hundred years, that means that this desert kingdom was very likely an ally of the ancient kingdom in some way or form. And in fact, recently the story has been shedding a lot more light on this very complicated relationship, but we'll cover more of that deeper down this iceberg. We also found normal poneglyphs located in Skypea underneath this golden bell on the island of Ohara, and also on Fishman Island we found this poneglyph describing Joyboy's apology letter to the mermaid princess. Now, the next poneglyph we found which finally opened up the true nature of these stones was the road poneglyph on top of the giant elephant Zoe. And it was actually at this point that the Straw Hats and us the audience finally learned that in order to find the One Piece, you would need to gather all the road poneglyphs just like Roger had done. Fortunately for us, the next two road poneglyphs had already been found and were under the control of the Emperor's Big Mom and Kaido. And besides the road poneglyph, Big Mom also held a few others which were also copied when the Straw Hats broke in to steal them. Which actually leads us to Wano, and after defeating Kaido, Robin was able to read the road poneglyph kept hidden in the depth of Wano under the water surface. However, these weren't the only poneglyphs here, and it was during this final stretch of the Wano arc that we also learned that the ancient weapon Pluton that we learned about in Alabasta was indeed located in Wano, and Robin had known about it ever since the Alabasta arc. And I think for now, that's all we're going to talk about about the Poneglyphs until still deeper in the iceberg, but let's stay on the topic of the most powerful weapons in the world, which are the ancient weapons. And just, you know, to recap, there are three of these super powerful weapons, and their names are Poseidon, Pluton, and Uranus, named after Greek gods. Now, at this point, we do know for sure that Poseidon is the power to control the gigantic sea kings. In fact, the current mermaid princess Shirahoshi was actually born with this power, and it is one of the most important secrets in the entire story because if anyone evil such as the world government or someone like the Emperor Blackbeard were to learn about Shirahoshi's powers, they would definitely try to capture her in order to use that power. And really, just to hammer this in, this power is absolutely ridiculous. I mean, just look how massive these sea kings are. Like, these are absolutely an island-destroying power, if not more. Which now brings us to Pluton, which at this point we finally know is located deep, deep beneath Wano country. And while we still do not know what the weapon actually is, there is a rumor that it was actually some sort of ship since Frankie once had the blueprints to a ship that could counter Pluton. However, there's actually some mystery about all of this because apparently Pluton can only be released once the borders of Wano are actually opened. Now, what that exactly means, we actually aren't quite sure, but it very likely has to do with destroying the giant walls that keep the original Wano separated from the rest of the world. World. And now since Poseidon is a power to rule under the seas and Pluton is likely a ship to dominate the surface of the ocean, then it makes sense also name-wise that Uranus would be a power that rules the air. And as a bit of a manga spoiler, but we actually got the clearest hint of Uranus's power back in chapter 1060 of the manga when the world government's secret ruler unleashed this truly terrifying power that destroyed the entire kingdom of Lulusia. And I mean, this is literally an island destroying power, literally, which is pretty strong evidence that this is an ancient weapon, or at least something that was based on one. And what's really scary here though, is that this weapon seems to be in the hands of the world government, and it does make me wonder if it was this power that helped them defeat the ancient kingdom back during the White Century in the first place. And now, if you've been paying attention throughout so far, you know that the world government was formed by 20 original rulers, yes, I'm gonna say that like still five more times in this video, and we do actually know who many of these families were originally, including the Nefatari family and the Don Quixote family. And very recently in the manga, we also learned the names of many more of these founding families, but beside their names, what's actually even more important is what they actually
actually chose to do after they defeated the ancient kingdom, which was of course to leave behind their original ruling islands and move on to the top of the Grand Line to become the Celestial Dragons. And there are actually theories that these new gods, as they like to think of themselves, moved up there because it was the original location of the Lunarian tribe. And if you remember, the Lunarians were actually considered the previous gods of the world, so this was like a big gigantic sign to the world that the 20 rulers were announcing themselves as the new gods of the world. And this actually brings us to another very interesting bit of history, because these rulers all originally agreed to rule together instead of appointing a single ruler, king or queen, to rule them all together. And that was actually symbolized by this very mysterious chair or throne called the Empty Throne, which officially no one is supposed to sit in. And to take it one step further, each of the founding families placed a weapon in front of that throne to show that they were actually basically laying down their weapons to all work together. Now, of course, we do know that all of this was basically one giant scam because at one point, the secret ruler Emu took control and is now considered the supreme ruler of the world. However, we don't really know if this is how it was right from the start or if Emu took power later on. In fact, what makes this even more mysterious in a lot of ways is that Emu is actually from one of these founding families. So it's pretty fair to assume that Emu was one of the original 20 rulers or it is also possible that they are descendants of whoever took power sometime after the world government was formed. But we don't really know for sure at this point quite yet. However, I actually just lied when I said that all of the founding families went up to live on Marijua because one family decided to give up their right to become world nobles and stayed behind on their home island. And that's of course the Nefatari family, and as we learned recently in the manga, their family ruler at the end of the Void Century was called Nefatari Lily. And while there is still a ton of mystery surrounding her, we have some pretty strong hints that she actually ended up betraying the world government in some sort of way, most likely something related to the Poneglyphs. But all of this meant that we have some vital questions that still need to be answered about the early years of the world government, and we'll get into more theories about this lore in just a moment. But honestly, at this point, it's probably a good thing that the Celestial Dragons mostly stayed away from the rest of the world because, as we learned from Doflamingo's flashback, when his Celestial Dragon family decided to come back and live with the common people, they were instantly rejected and nearly executed by a mob of common citizens. And even though Doflamingo survived this incident, the Celestial Dragons refused to let him back into Marijua because his father had already renounced their status as world nobles, so yeah. Yeah. These nobles are both truly cruel and they also hold grudges. But they also have the absolute power in the world to enslave people, murder, and waste extraordinary amounts of money. And actually, one of the best examples of this is this random bridge where Robin was actually sent after Saba Odi. This bridge is called Tequila Wolf, and its story is that sometime about 700 years ago, some world noble ordered that a bridge be built between two islands. And here they are, still building it all these years later. Now, we don't exactly know the purpose of all this, it could have just been a random wish that they had, but I do kind of wonder if the bridge actually ends up serving a greater purpose here. Because if you think about it, we do know that the seas, especially in the Grand Line, are ruled by people who can sail, like pirates and marines. But maybe the world government decided to make this bridge so they wouldn't need to rely on ships that could easily easily be attacked by pirates. Just a thought. And another piece of history that's really interesting is that Sanji's family, the Vinsmokes, founded their kingdom around 250 years ago in the North Blue. And while they eventually ended up losing their rule of the North Blue itself, they recently played a really important role in the development of cloning technology. And if you ask me, this is just an insane development in the entire One Piece world. In particular, the Vinsmokes specialize in mass producing clones to fight in their mercy armies. And believe me, there are even crazier clones coming up in tier level 4, but did you even know that some parts of the One Piece community once thought that Luffy might in fact be a clone as well? Crazy, right? But I mean, you never know. And in fact, Luffy's family lineage has always been a very big mystery. We do know that he has his grandfather Garp and his father Dragon, who is the leader of the revolutionary army. But we've never known about his mother, which does mean that now is the perfect time to throw 
in my personal favorite theory that Crocodile is actually Luffy's mother. And if you've never heard of this idea, it comes from the fact that Crocodile and Ivankov, who is a gender morphing officer of the Revolutionary Army, have some sort of secret that they won't tell anyone. And so basically, the idea is that once upon a time, Crocodile was a woman who gave birth to Luffy and then had Ivankov change them into a man. And as dumb as this sounds, there's actually a ton of evidence for this theory, but I'll just leave it at that for now because it is time now to dive headfirst into the chilly depths of tier level 4, which is lore that you would really only know if you are a hardcore fan of the One Piece story. And what better way to start this off than by discussing one of the rarest abilities in the entire story, the voice of all things. Now maybe you already know some of the basics, which is that the voice of all things is this mysterious power that allows its users to somehow hear and understand the voices of creatures and objects in the One Piece world. For example, when Luffy was about to destroy this giant ship, he heard the Sea Kings telling him to stop, and while he couldn't himself communicate back, he could basically understand what was being said. Other examples include when the future Shogun of Wano, Momonosuke, could understand and communicate with the giant elephant Zonisha, but beyond that, the voice of all things can let its users understand even written text such as that on the Poneglyphs, which they wouldn't normally be able to read. However, that's of course not to say that these users understand the messages perfectly. It's more like they get a vague sense of what's being communicated, if you get my drift. But what you may not know is that there appears to be levels of skill with this ability as well. For example, Roger himself used this ability to understand the meaning of many of the Poneglyphs by himself, which led him to go back and find others. On top of that, people like Momo and his father Kozuki Oden could clearly understand the voice of the elephant Sonisha, whereas Luffy could usually only hear a sort of unrecognizable voice. Now to get to the lore side of this, there are theories that this ability is actually caused by a super strong observation hockey, and other theories that this power is tied to certain descendants of the Ancient Kingdom genetically, but we really don't quite know yet for sure. But now one crazy bit of lore that you may have never heard of is that the One Piece world might not always have been most mostly covered in water. And while this hasn't been officially confirmed yet, there are some truly powerful hints that this is possible. For example, the original Wano country was lost underwater as we saw at the end of the Wano arc. This happened because at one point walls were erected around Wano itself and then rainwater eventually filled the space between the walls. Plus in chapter 115, way back at the early stages of the story, we actually learned that dinosaurs once freely roamed around the world, but now there are isolated on this island. So it would make sense to me at least that the world used to have much more land exposed and then some natural disaster or not so natural disaster happened that caused the world to flood. And so now you might be wondering what kind of natural disaster could do that, but we actually have a clue from chapter 1089 of the manga. And fair warning that there will be manga spoilers for pretty much all of the remaining lore from here on out. So in chapter 1060, we did see that kingdom of Lulucia erased by this mysterious power, but what's even crazier is that in chapter 1089, we actually learned that this event somehow caused the sea level all around the globe to rise by one meter. Which at first maybe doesn't sound like a lot, but man, if you calculate how much water that actually is and what that would actually mean if that happened around our world, you get an insane amount, like four quadrillion liters of water. Like, what? How is that even possible from this one single event? And if it was really caused by using this deadly weapon, just imagine if this weapon was used over and over and over again. I'm just saying, it isn't too insane to think that the world might once have had a lot more land and then steadily stuff was eradicated, sea levels rose, and now it's all islands. Now, of course, this is speculation, but if you want an absolute connection to the disaster that now wiped out Lilusia, look no further than this giant gaping hole below Anna's lobby. I mean, those holes do look strikingly similar, right? So we do have to assume that this same weapon was used at least once before and caused this giant hole underneath Anna's lobby. And so we have to ask ourselves then, what was there that got wiped off the map? Well, for one, it could have been the actual home island of the Ancient Kingdom or some other very important location like 
maybe Love Tale? Just saying, it could make a lot of sense why no one has found it yet if the legendary island really is at the bottom of a giant hole surrounded by world government facilities. And now, if that was surprising to you, just wait until you hear this next bit of lore, because recently, during the Egghead Island arc, we learned that the past civilization was way more technologically advanced than the current era. And even the genius scientist Dr. Vegapunk told us that he is barely catching up to the technology that actually used to exist in the distant past. Now, of course, we can assume that Vegapunk is talking here about the time before the Void Century and the founding of the world government, which, when you really think about what that means, is completely mind-blowing. But to take things even further, it is wildly assumed that the world government were actually the ones who erased much of the technology from the world on purpose to begin with. And while this could certainly be possible, I would be very careful about assuming that the world government did this all for evil reasons. I mean, I mean, we've all seen stories about advanced civilizations that eventually get wiped out or wipe themselves out because of advanced technology or evil robots. So maybe the world government did the world a favor if they truly did rid the world of most of its technology, or maybe that's just how it's easier to control people. Don't give them access to the most advanced technology. However, with this knowledge that the world used to be more advanced, we open up some truly incredible possibilities about the lore of the ancient world. For example, we already discussed that at one point, the winged people of Skypea and Shandora once lived up on the moon, but that doesn't mean that they always lived there to begin with. In fact, you might say that they fled up there to escape oppression, just like the Minx moved up to Zunisha and the Fishmen moved under the sea. And with the advanced technology of the past, this makes a lot more sense that maybe there was some sort of spaceship to take all the winged people up to the moon. After all, there are space pirates in One Piece. Although we also have confirmed that the golden city of Shandora, which was the home of the winged Chanyan tribe, was around 1,100 years ago. So clearly they came down off the moon well before the Void Century, apparently due to resource problems. But on top of that, would you believe that devil fruits might actually also be technology-based creations? Basically, biotechnology? I mean, just think about it. We do know that artificial devil fruits were created using current technology, and while some were better than others, can you just imagine the possibilities of much, much more advanced societies and the powers that they could potentially create? After all, there is a quote even in our world that if technology is advanced enough, it's basically indistinguishable from magic. Plus, now that we're discussing it, I even wonder if this technological advancement is what allowed humans to eventually overthrow the Lunarian race in the first place, because remember that the Lunarians were considered basically untouchable gods, so something had to change in order for mere humans to basically wipe them out. And I can certainly imagine the new technology of Devil Fruits playing a major role in that. And now, as exciting as all of these possibilities are, let's bring this back to some factual lore that we know from the story. Because one of the oldest events that we know of in the entire story of One Piece is the birth of the giant elephant Zunisha. They were born well over 1000 years ago and were closely allied with the legendary Joy Boy. However, at some point Zunisha committed a crime so bad that they were forced to walk the oceans forever. Now, this is the interesting part here though because while we don't know what crime Zunisha committed, we might be able to guess based on its behavior during the Wano arc. Because if you remember, Zunisha briefly came to Wano right as Luffy awakened Gear 5. But then it left before it could do anything important. And we can guess that Zunisha left because the future Shogun Momo decided that it was way too early to open the borders of Wano. So based on this, we can guess that Zunisha's main role was to open the borders of Wano, which most likely means destroying the walls that were once built around it, which is just the perfect job for a massive island-sized elephant. But the amazing thing is that we can connect this to what we discussed earlier about Pluton. Just to recap, we were told that Pluton could not be used until the borders were open, so that might mean that Zunisha is the key to unlocking Pluton, or maybe Pluton is literally buried in the walls and they need Zunisha to break it open. Kind of like the One Piece version of the rumbling. 
something, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> and so to tie this all back to Zanisha's crime, I can just imagine that Zanisha was once supposed to help the Ancient Kingdom by using or unlocking Pluton, but they failed to do so and were then forced to walk the Earth as punishment. However, that is not all about this ancient elephant because there are some crazy ties between the elephant and the One Piece treasure that are just too spicy for tier level 4, so we'll save them for the next tier. And in fact, what should also be hidden probably from history is that Dressrosa has a very dark past when it comes to racism. That's because the Don Quixote family that Doflamingo is part of actually ruled Dressrosa before the Void Century, and during that time, they enslaved the entire tribe of the Tontada dwarves and forced the dwarves to work as slaves for centuries. This really only ended once the Don Quixote family moved up to Marijua after the Void Century, and it was this time that the Riku family took over leadership of the island and ended up freeing those slaves, which led to 800 years of peace until the warlord Don Flamingo, part of the Don Quixote family, came back and took back the throne. And now speaking of special races in One Piece again, during the Whole Cake Island arc we actually learned that Big Mom's dream was to make a paradise for all of the races of the world. And she almost succeeded because members of basically every race lived in Whole Cake Island except for three very special ones. First are the giants who hated Big Mom after a potential marriage between their King Loki and one of Big Mom's daughters didn't go quite as planned, so you won't find any of these large folks walking around there. The second missing race was revealed during Wano to be one of the Lunarians, which actually makes sense why there weren't any in Big Mom's territory because Kaido's right hand man King is technically known as the last one still alive. And the third missing race was finally revealed during Kuma's flashback, which is the race of Buccaneers. Interestingly enough, these people seem to be a sort of crossover between giants and humans due to their incredible size and strength. And just like the Lunarians, there is only one confirmed member of this tribe left, and that is the former warlord turned cyborg slave, Kuma. However, there is actually one other living creature at least still with buccaneer blood, and that is the Seraphim Esper. Now to be fair, Esper is a genetically modified clone, not a full-on buccaneer, but I do wonder if somehow this Seraphim will play a massive role in restoring the buccaneer race at some point in the story. And while we're talking about the Seraphim anyways at this point, now might as well be as good a time as ever to mention that these creatures are the only ones in the One Piece world who have devil fruit powers without ever actually eating one. Now, before we get too far away from the buccaneers too quickly here, we also have to mention the mind-blowing possibility that the ancient figure Nika was actually a member of the buccaneer race himself. In case you don't remember, Nika and Joy Boy are often referenced when discussing the same person from the Void Century, but we don't actually know that they are the same person. All we do know is that Elephant Zanisha declared that Joy Boy had returned at the same time that Luffy awakened his Nika devil fruit. Now one thing that is certain though is that the buccaneer race knew about Nika and basically worshipped him as their savior. Plus, if you look at the giant frozen straw hat in the top of Marijoa, it makes a lot of sense now that this head would fit on the head of an extra large human, like a buccaneer, rather than a full-size giant. So yeah, lots of signs pointing towards a connection between Joy Boy, Nika, and the buccaneer race. Before we go into the insane lore of level 5 though, let's hand back to Marijo for a second because there is of course this mysterious line about the national treasure of Marijo and this was revealed by Doflamingo himself, but we never got to learn what it actually is. It could be something that we've already seen, like the secret ruler of the world Emu, the mega weapon that destroyed Lilusia, or the frozen straw hat that we just discussed. Another really interesting option is that it could be some of the frozen warriors of the past. I mean, why else keep a giant secret freezer? Or maybe it is something even more insane, like a secret devil fruit tree that could be the original source of all devil fruits. Call back to the Eve tree from earlier. And while we don't really know for sure, one other really interesting bit of lore about the devil fruits is that there is some sort of hint that devil fruits may have a will of their own. This kind of ties
ties into the whole idea that devil fruits have some sort of spirit or soul of their own and they will naturally seek out people who represent core ideas of that fruit. And the first clear hint that we got for this was back in chapter 1044 when the Gorosei said that it seemed like the Nika fruit had been evading them for the past 800 years even though they had been trying to capture it. And when we see Luffy first awakening at fruit it legit seemed for a moment like he was possessed by some kind of maniac spirit that he literally could not stop laughing. So don't be surprised if we find out later that devil fruits actually possess some sort of spirit or soul in themselves, maybe connected to inherited will as well. However, we can't leave tier number four without bringing up one of the most mysterious and least talked about topics in the entire story. I'm talking about this thing. Like seriously, what is this? It has never been talked about in the story and it is only ever shown on Roger's ship. We do know that he had it after reaching Lodestar Island, which is the second to last island of the Grand Line, the official last one, and the only place that Roger first learned about the Poneglyphs. So maybe he found it there? I mean, we don't really know, nor do we know what it actually is. For a long time, community theorists thought that it was a dragon or an ancient weapon, but at this point, really, who knows? One thing that we do know, though, is that it simply has to reappear before the end of the story and have some sort of meaning. And now, as we dive down into the depth of the second to last tier of the iceberg to level 5, we are really getting into lore and history that requires a ton of deep analysis and even some level of speculation. And if you know all of this already, you're most likely a professional One Piece fan. For example, did you know that just like the real world, many events in the One Piece worlds are actually cyclical, which means that they happen over and over again throughout the centuries. And Oda even shows us this by having similar arcs between the pre and post time skip. For example, Alabasta and Dressrosa are both very similar. In Alabasta, a warlord nearly takes over a kingdom, but then was stopped by Luffy. And then in Dressrosa, a warlord did successfully already take over a country before they were then stopped by Luffy. Another example is Arlong Park and Fishman Island, both of which dealt with the issue of racism. Now, why is this important? Well, because if we take the idea that events happen in cycles in One Piece, then you can surely bet that the events of the Void Century are going to be repeated in the present story. The key difference here, though, is that Luffy will most likely succeed where in the past, Joy Boy tragically failed. And this will ultimately mean that Luffy will be successful in uniting all of the races of the world to live freely on top of the globe. I mean, he's already basically done that with all of his allies and friends that he has made along the way, and this time when the world government attempts their <clears throat> great cleansing as they call it, Luffy and his friends will be able to actually stop it. And while this great cleansing is sure to be a truly awful event, I bet that you'll be surprised when I tell you that the world secret ruler Emu may not be as bad as we all actually think. And this takes some digging into his family name, which is Nerona. Again, one of the 20 kingdoms who started the world government. Now, while we don't know for sure, this family name could have been inspired by the Roman Emperor Nero, who has a ton of interesting history and connections to Imo himself. First off, he ruled over Rome at the very end of what is considered the Julio-Claudian dynasty, just like Imo is ruling over what will very likely be the end of the world government era in One Piece. On top of that, Nero is usually considered one of the worst emperors for some awful acts that he's said to have committed, like burning down the city of Rome. However, if you really dive a little bit deeper into his history, there are a bunch of false myths and legends about Nero that made him seem a lot, lot worse than he apparently actually was. And I won't really get into those here in detail, but if Nero really was the inspiration for Emu, then there might be a whole other story to Emu that we still don't no, some tragic history that they had. So I'm not saying they are a good guy, but it's definitely possible that they are a lot more complex than just a simple evil dictator. And now actually speaking of Emu's family, at this point in the manga, we do know many of the family names of the original 20 rulers. They are Nerona, Don Quixote, Nefatari, as well as the names of the five elders, which are Jay Garcia, Marcus, Topman, Ethan Baron, and Shepard. And in fact, we may have also another founding family, the 
Garling family, but they haven't been officially confirmed as one of the original 20 kings, though they are celestial dragons, so it would just make sense. And now to bring this all back to Nefatari Lily, while we don't know what exactly happened to her at the end of the Void Century, we do know that she somehow ended up disappearing. So it is possible that she was just hunted down and killed by the world government. Another option is that she went on to create the island of women, Amazon Lily, since they share all the same name. Or who knows, maybe Lily even ended up becoming Emu in some sort of weird twist. Either way, something happened between Lily and Emu if they're not the same person, which led Lily to reject the other nobles and side with the ancient kingdom. But before we move on from Emu, one last shocking bit of lore is that Emu might actually be some sort of child. Now, we've long thought that Emu and the Gorosei might be immortal, but there are some actual clues that Emu might have had their age frozen while they were a kid. For example, their speech style in Japanese is very similar to that of a child. Plus, if you've ever seen Emu sitting on the empty throne, they always appear extraordinarily small. Now, the throne might just be massive, but don't rule out the possibility that they are just a child or someone with a very, very small body. And while we don't know exactly why they are so childlike, but it likely has to do with their very mysterious power. In fact, we already have a devil fruit that freezes your age, which is the Hobby Hobby no Mi, and its user was a child who literally forced people to become toy slaves. So I'm just saying that this is the kind of ability that has already happened in the story, going insane circles. Now, this next bit of lore stretches way, way back even before the White Century because did you know that the Long Arm and Long Leg tribes have been having some sort of ongoing war for over 1,000 years? Crazy, right? While the rest of the world was battling it out during the Void Century, these dudes were just over here kind of fighting each other, doing their own thing. And I bet that this next piece of lore might honestly shock you and it has to do with the current storyline. That's because did you know that we we have never had a single person actually drown in the actual story of One Piece, which is just mind-boggling if you ask me, so surely that means that Oda is saving this awful fate for someone truly important in the story, right? Like maybe Emu or Blackbeard or something? But if that happens at all though, it will very likely be at the very end of the story, which is also when we should finally find Love Tail and find the One Piece. However, did you know that Oda may have been laying clues about the origin of Love Tale and the Ancient Kingdom right in front of our eyes this entire time? Let me explain. We learned during the Skypiea arc that part of the island of Jaya was launched up into the sky. And when you put these two pieces together, it forms the shape of a skull. Classic pirate stuff, right? Well, if you look very closely at the skull-shaped map, you might also notice that the left eye of the skull is actually missing, which at first glance might not mean anything. I mean, it is an island after all, and they usually aren't super perfectly shaped, but when you really dig into the symbolism of the left eye throughout the story, you will learn that the left eye plays a significant, although quite hidden role throughout One Piece. For one, a missing or closed eye shows up quite frequently on volume covers that discuss the world government, Void Century, or the Ancient Kingdom. For example, in volume 11, Nami here has her left eye closed, and in this volume, Luffy and his crew defeated Arlong, save Nami's village, and throw a massive feast to celebrate. So really hitting on the themes for freedom, laughter, and celebration. Then we have volume cover 27, where Luffy has his left eye closed, and in this volume, we have this panel of Luffy looking like Nika dancing by the fire, as well as some other truly deep connections about the golden bell and it has a lot of similarities to the drums of liberation as well. And there are many more examples of left eyes being closed during important volumes such as these and throughout the regular storyline as well. But the important thing is that during all of these volumes, we are learning important lore. So clearly there is a tie between the left eye and the ancient lore of One Piece. Similarly, we have many important scars such as Luffy, Garp and Zoro's being on the left eye and Luffy's father's tattoo also being on the left side. So all of this leads me to believe that this missing left eye on the island of Jaya is just too significant to ignore. Whether that missing piece is 
is Love Tale or maybe the home of the Ancient Kingdom. I'm not 100% sure, but I wouldn't be surprised if it shows up again in the future. However, it is now time for the deepest, juiciest and darkest bits of lore in One Piece down at level 6, starting with the fact that Emu might truly be a demon or some sort of nightmarish creature. There were hints at this during chapters 1085 and 86 when we saw his shadowy silhouette, but even more evidence is during chapter 1094 when we see this demon-like transformation from one of the Gorosei, Saint Saturn. And I mean, wow, like no one was expecting this. And while these abilities are still very much a mystery, it is truly making me believe that the Gorosei and Emu might just straight up be devils or demons or have some other sort of demonic powers that are kind of different from devil fruits. What's really interesting about the Gorosei and Emu though is that we have been explicitly told that they have natural enemies in the D-Clan. Now, I'm sure at this point you know that there are many people all around the world with the initial D, such as Monkey D. Luffy and his family. There are also Gold D. Roger and his son Ace, plus the giant here is also a D. Even someone like Law has the initial D, and we recently learned that Nitafari Lily was actually Nefatari D. Lily, which means that Vivi, who the Straw Hats befriended early in the story, is technically also a member of the D Clan. So clearly, all these D Clan members are not all related by blood, but you may be surprised to learn that we got a really big hint about the origins of the D-Clan in a brief recent flashback. Because in chapter 1085, we learned that Luffy and Ace actually told Sabo that he could have the D-initial in his name too, since he was technically their friend. And while you might think that they are just messing around as kids, I highly doubt that Oda would just throw this in there if it didn't have any real significance later on. So it might very well be the case that the D-Clan were a bunch of friends who banded together and adopted adopted this secret initial in order to stand up for their beliefs. However, this next bit of lore is even more secret because it is now time to talk about the important role of whales in the story. We already mentioned Laboon and how he was waiting at the start of the Grand Line for his friends to return, but did you know that there are many other connections between whales and Love Tale? For example, in chapter 8, there was a whale fountain in the same chapter that Nami is looking for a map to the Grand Line. Then at the start of the Grand Line where we first learn about Love Tale, Laboon is literally the first thing that the crew sees. And then what happens when they enter the second half of the Grand Line? You guessed it, a pot of whales appears as well. Then the first time we see a road poneglyph, it is literally inside a whale tree, so clearly Oda is making it a point that whales are an important piece to this whole puzzle here. And on top of that, we know that whales love music, and in particular, the song Bing Sake, or as they dubbed it now in English, Bing Sprue, which I don't really like, so Bing Sake it is, which is a pirate song that is connected to the One Piece. Now, you might be wondering, what does this all have to do with the One Piece treasure? Well, let's go back to Laboon for a second, because when the crew gets trapped inside of the whale, they meet the Dr. Crocus, who's taking care of Laboon from the inside, and we do know that Crocus was part of Roger's crew when they found the One Piece, and he had his own little island inside of Laboon. So one idea is that all of this could be hints that the island Love Tale itself is an island inside of a giant whale. And when you combine this with the deep water currents that we learned about in chapter 604, it all adds up to a very good explanation for why only Roger and his crew have been able to find Love Tale in over 800 years. Which is just because the island itself might have actually been hiding inside of a whale that has been hiding in the deep water currents and can only be found using a certain method described on the road poneglyph. And it really all fits with the idea of whales and friendship, especially since we know that the ancient kingdom already had a connection with other giant creatures such as Zunisha. And now, while this is of course partially at least a theory, we cannot deny that the clues are really there. Just like how I know that if you've been watching the entire time until now, you either absolutely love One Piece and have nothing better to do, or you're just slaving away in the background doing your chores right now or working and just listening to this. And I mean, lucky for you, even though this video is over, I have the perfect thing to keep going for you with, with a massive One Piece theory iceberg video this time, which you can watch by simply clicking right here. Thanks for watching. Good luck, whatever you're up to right now. And I will see you in the next one. Thanks for watching till the end.